Good morning to Borowski. Well, you know, I've been making these videos for about two years now, approaching my second anniversary for whatever good it's done. But anyway, um, as the United States screeches to a halt before its fiscal cliff, sounds like something from a Sylvester the Cat cartoon. Fiscal cliff. Anyway, they've forgotten that other people have been poised over a cliff and have been resisting being pushed over, not just politicians, but the population in general. There's been talk of Europe's so-called lost generation. These are Europe's 20-somethings, the hardest hit victims of Europe's austerity recession, or depression, as they called in the more honest pre-neoliberal days. In the southern rim of Europe, along the Mediterranean, are the most spectacular examples of unemployment, of a complete sense of futility of resistance to unemployment as it's reached among the young 50 to 60 percent. The westernmost and easternmost rim, as in Ireland and Poland, is just about as bad. Their condition is only marginally better than their peers across the Mediterranean in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, who took matters in their own hands beginning two years ago. We're told, in the usual patronizing language of those with money, that it's their own fault for being in such a pass, or rather the fault of their governments for borrowing beyond their means. This is always the rhetoric of creditors to lenders, nicely ignoring that poor governments, like poor families, are poor because they're born into a structured hierarchy of wealth and poverty and have only limited options of coping and surviving in the unnatural environment they're placed. Debt to pay the bills or to compensate for lost dignity or taking back what's been taken from them. But what about hard work as a means to escape poverty? Fine, except the means of work have been taken from them, reducing them to financial dependency. That's why they're poor, you flaming idiot. When far away others own the means of production and consumption, and these others decide to make you pay out the ass for what you can get in currency they own, when they take away from you your independent means, but won't replace it themselves, then you're left stewing in dead water. It's the old story of blaming the victim they fleeced for being stupid enough to put himself at their mercy. Another way of passing the buck is to argue that it's cultural malfeasance that's responsible that Mediterranean peoples are just too flamboyant in their lifestyle, preferring to be like the grasshopper and while away their productive time in cafes and bibing ouzo, rather than being like the thrifty, productive ant of the north, rolling those same grains and leaves uphill and having time uh, to show for what they've done. This cultural rationalization is just a retweaking of older racial arguments of a century ago, and was even recently endorsed by a New York Times article by Andrew Higgins, praising Latvia as a neoliberal success story, and hence role model for the rest of Europe. That should come as no surprise, considering the retrograde trajectory of the U.S. establishment and its mouthpiece. So how did Latvia do it? By, of course, slashing wage levels and leaving the tax burden primarily on labor and lightly on capital gains. The same austerity package. The difference is that this sturdy, thrifty, Protestant Baltic people accepted their task of getting down to business instead of protesting, rioting, and striking about it. This is typical propaganda sleight of hand, first because it assumes that what's good for the capital gains class must be good for the rest of the population. Look at the Latvian story a little closer, and you must either laugh at the stupidity of the neoliberal naivete of the New York Times and Andrew Higgins, or become very afraid of what the future holds for the rest of the continent. Latvia's miracle is based on, first of all, disfranchising a third of the population, in this case ethnic Ruskies, deciding they are non-citizens because their family roots were planted after 1940 and therefore do not count as part of the statistical Latvian population. As illegal aliens now, their unemployment, their disintegration do not matter and they are to be pushed out as soon as possible. But it doesn't stop with delegitimizing ethnic foreigners by the stroke of a pen. 10% of ethnic Latvians have quietly departed their sinking mothership too, just like those thriftless Spaniards and Irish and Yugoslavs. The Latvian government countered this by counting as Latvians all members of the diaspora, old or new, who have come back to visit, hiding the extent of the human hemorrhage. This framing of economic policy as ethnic politics, it's, if it's bad for the Ruskies, it's good for you, is the same kind of ethnic scapegoating we in the USNA are all too familiar with, putting the New York Times in the same company as Jörg Haider or Jean-Marie Le Pen. For governments willing to ignore the will and suffering of their people, Latvia can be a perverse model and indeed a success story. But only if the country can afford to let 10% of its population immigrate. 
demonize and disfranchise a significant other percentage as illegals who don't belong and don't count, and don't mind seeing family reproduction rates plummet and a population that is thoroughly depoliticized over any other issues than ethnic nationalism and language. Latvia can be a success like a Roman peace. Make a desert and then call it what you want it to be, as you see it. But he can't blame the victim any longer for his own complicity if he recognizes the injustice of what he's been subjected to and refuses to be a part of it any longer. Refuses to be swindled by demagoguery from politicos and smooth swindling lies from bankers. There has been action in parts of the Euro colonies, the indignados of Spain, the protests of Greece, but so far this has not led to sustained action. The youth of Europe are still conditioned to think they have something to lose if they take initiative against their chains, that if they rock the boat, their European prosperity and way of life will sink, and they'll be its first casualties while the Angela Merkels and Christine Lagarde have all the lifeboats. Let me share a little secret with you. The post-war European prosperity that defined the continent since the end of World War II, it's gone. It's dead, floating face down in the water. It was killed by a contract hitman in Maastricht. The youth of Spain, Italy, Greece, Yugoslavia, Portugal, Ireland, and Poland, and Latvia need to wake the fuck up to realize that they have nothing to lose but their chains. Then only by imitating the youth of Tunisia, of Egypt, or even Libya or Syria are they going to force change on smug elites who are determined there will be none. In fact, if you look at a map, you'll see the affected zones are pretty contiguous with German occupation of two generations ago. This is no accident, as they say. The liberation of 1945 has been reversed, this time by stealth, not jackboots. The new order has built a new Berlin Wall, not for itself, but for all of Europe, with NATO snipers on the watchtowers to pick off any trying to escape. But it's not too late for a second liberation. Throw out the collaborators from your own countries first, then begin to encircle Berlin from two fronts. Pretty soon the forces of liberation can even penetrate occupied France, throwing Berlin back on itself, letting it stew in its own collapse. Europe was freed by the rubble of Berlin once, Europe has rebuilt itself by rubbling Europe. Either Europeans simply embrace the rubble of their devastated nations, like Latvia, or they can rise from it again and rebuild and rubble its oppressors. Or you'll deserve the jackbooted occupation they call austerity that they forced on you. I say, let there be a European spring in 2013 that will inspire the world, sweeping away the dead weight of money in central banks. They will force the Merkels into the bunkers of their own defeat and the Lagards before the tribunals of liberation. Maybe we can hear a new Marseillaise drifting in the wind? Even if it's just the faintest echo, the choice is yours. You can take it. Like Janis Joplin once sang, freedom's just another name for nothing left to lose. If the men and women in change are really free in spirit if they only knew it with a world to win. Force their captors to make the choice of having to shoot to prevent change, to watch their political pretenses dissolve as a tin on mint square, or to watch Angela Merkel's Berlin Wall fall again. <laughs>